Coming up on Techzilla, SSDs fail. The NSA, well, they're helping keep home networks secure. 4G fight, Sprint versus Verizon, dual boot help, and... Kittes! So crack open a can of tuna and make Mr. Little Jeans bang, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Netflix, GoDaddy, and Gamefly. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or a delicious all-natural cola substitute, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. Mm, cola substitute. Okay. I lived in New York. I went to school in the shadow of the World Trade Towers. Call me a romantic, but last night's news kind of dwarfed any tech news that could possibly break this Monday. But we're going to talk, well, computer security anyhow. The NSA, a.k.a. the National Security Agency, a.k.a. Signals Intelligence and Cryptography for the United States. Big group of smart people. They're saying upgrade to Windows 7, at least upgrade to Vista, preferably 64-bit. Just step away from Windows XP. That is the first fact found in the NSA data sheet, best practices for keeping your home network secure. There's a lot of common sense there. Number two is install a comprehensive host-based security suite, at least under the Windows section, and automate its updates. We've told you about this. Some of it though you, you might not have thought about sandboxing capabilities and PDF readers and implementing full disk encryption on laptops as sort of a standard uh, operating procedure. Datasheet includes guidelines for Windows and Apple operating systems, your home network, implement an alternative DNS provider. Uh, actually, that's actually a really good idea, but I'll let you read their thing to find out why. Yeah, and our personal favorite, <laughs> Operational Security Internet Behavior Recommendations. I love that title. Yeah, we've got a link to the PDF, which is hosted at nsa.gov in the show notes. And uh, speaking of security, OS 10 users that get a pop-up for Mac Defender, well, you're getting a Windows experience. It's a Trojan trying to trick you into installing Installing it says Intego, an OS 10 security firm. If you do give it your admin password and install it, it launches browser windows full of porn to convince you you've got spyware. Then, when you try to remove the viruses, well, I'll quote Macworld.com, they first have to register Mac Defender. Clicking on the link to do so via the program's about screen takes them to an unsecure website that offers a one-year, two-year, or lifetime license to get the program for $60, $70, or $80, respectively. Registering halts the virus warnings, thus confirming that the program is working. Irritating? Macworld says the level of concern over infection remains low. Users must be tricked into downloading and installing the program, as well as entering their administrative password. Um, so do yourself a favor, OS 10 users. Uncheck Safari's open safe files after downloading option to prevent all this from happening. We've got a link in the show notes to Macworld's article that tells you how to do just that. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, because I've seen that on Windows a bunch lately where it's like, oh my goodness, you have a virus and you can't close it and you can't stop it. And, you know, it's just. So, does this actually, this actually makes you pay for something too. So, it's not just tricking yeah. you, it's also actually getting money from you. Yes. It's, 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 it's not just like, hey, we're going to do weird stuff in your computer or hey, yeah. we're going to, you know, bot your, you know, turn your computer into zo part of our zombie botnet to attack places. It's like literally, we're going to do naughty stuff to your computer in an effort to try to make you. Pay oh, us and you just paid us eighty dollars to do it. So thanks. <laughs> Anyhow, good read on MacWorld.com. Definitely check it out. Coding Horror, aka Jeff Atwood, says SSD drives fail. I quote: As an early advocate of solid-state hard drives, I feel ethically and morally obligated to let you in on a dirty little secret I've discovered in the last two years of full-time SSD ownership. Solid-state hard drives fail mm -hmm. a lot, and not just any fail. I'm talking about catastrophic. Oh my God! What just happened to all my data? Instant giga fail. It's not pretty. He goes on to say two of his three crucial 128 gigabyte SSDs he bought in October Ugh. 2009 have failed. And then his yeah. friend Portman Willis. Yeah, he had all eight of his SSDs he's bought in the last two years fail. It's all eight of them. Every single one of them failed. Uh, we're not seeing this, are you? Um, in any case, back up. Back up your stuff. It is vitally important. He, they, the whole thing that made me crazy, though, about this article that I thought was hilarious is, is he's that, like, I just bought an OCC Vertex 3! <laughs> no, he's like, oh. he's like, SSD is, is so awesome that right. I don't even care that they're failing. I'm so accustomed to the performance bump that I'm getting using a right. solid-state drive. Dropping back to a standard 
is hard like, drive is so horrible. He will not even consider it. He's like, I right. will put up with with the crashes. I will put up with the colossal hard drive fails because I love using my SSD so much. I gotta say, I gotta say, his his buddy that's had eight drives fail that that reeks to me of like gigantic local power nightmares or something. Because I can't. No, I'm just like. That's an amazing, like statistically, yeah. that is the ultimate bizarre end of the bell curve anomaly. Unless yeah. you email us if your CNF SSD is failing unusually fast, Texilla at revision3.com. We are curious. We're very curious. Because we're not seeing that kind of fail. Uh, you know, locally. I've heard of it happening, I, just not with that kind of regularity, not right. with every single SSD that people have been using. And on one, two, wait, actually, I can count down actually. Three, two, one. What's the magic word? Back up! <laughs> Back up, back it up, back, back it up, up back that data up, back it up. David in Redding, California writes, okay, so on your recent episode, you mentioned how non-standard the amperage is on micro USB. This begs the question, if I have a headset that takes an input of 50 milliamps and a charger that puts out 750 milliamps, will the charger damage the battery or just charge it faster? Thanks, David in Redding, California. Look, David says it actually does 500 milliamps, mm -hmm. um, but he's got a 750 milliamp charger. Here's the thing, just plug it in. Voltage beyond the range of the device. The device is gonna look at the voltage and be like, is it too high, is it too low? If it's too low, it won't charge it. If it's too high, it may basically shut itself off. Um, seems to create, in my experience, more issues than over amperage. Within reason, don't like take your iPhone and try to wire it into your car battery directly because you'll fry it, it's not gonna work. But it's actually amazing how smart uh, the onboard power charging and regulation is for most consumer electronics devices these days. We're talking about phones, cameras, uh, mostly phones and, and, and you know phones, video cameras, and uh, I want to say like uh, you know iPods and stuff. They do a really good mm. job of regulating themselves. Um, USB, micro USB, because the thing is like most cell phones, you can't find a way to throw more amps at it, right? Because you buy, you have a weird little jack, you buy the weird little jack adapter from you know, the manufacturer and you're kind of done. If you take a look at, uh, you know, the USB chargers going into an iPhone, um, iClarified found that the, uh, the iPhone's wall ward, the standard wall ward, it was 23% faster than using a 500 uh, milliamp USB port. Interesting. I'm convinced that my iPhone charges considerably faster off the iPad adapter, which is 2.1 amps compared to the, like, amp for the iPhone 4 oh. adapter. There's also questions about whether or not the higher amperage will compromise the battery life by overcharging it. I don't think so if the charging profile is smart enough. It's amazing how much in the last, you know, in the last decade or so how much battery charging has changed in terms of if they do like multiple stage charging, the float level charging is different. You know, you can use a higher amperage and you sort of level it at all. It's just, it's a fascinating subject. In any case, USB charging with a standard five volts, go ahead and plug your device in. I don't think 750 milliamps to 500 milliamps is gonna create any issues. I fried um, I fried gadgets before, but I, and not like regular gadgets, like um, drills. Like, like I had two separate Black and Decker drills, and I used um, a different. I used a charger for one on another one, uh -huh. and it totally destroyed it. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. So I guess that perhaps you are doomed. Perhaps doomed to perhaps it's to... just my force field. I have a bad force field. <laughs> it's the no curtain installation <laughs> force field that surrounds Ms. Belmont. Anyway, uh, next question. Nathan writes in Patrick, Veronica, and Robert. In a recent episode with the power strip with the rotating plugs, Patrick said that the faceplate on the receptacle should be removed before installing the power strip. This is a bad idea. The plug face itself sits about a quarter inch past the plane of the wall. So when you install the power strip, it will leave a quarter inch deep gap between the back and the wall and the receptacle box without the faceplate will be exposed. This allows dirt, debris, and other items to get down in there and into your electrical contacts. Exposed dirty contacts, bad. From the stories you tell me about your kids, just possibly the pointy end of a screwdriver or a butter knife ending in a trip to the ER. Yay. Love the show and keep up the awesomeness. Nathan's in Billings, Montana. I got, I got your email, Nathan, and, and I realized three things. One, all of, I've got three of the 360 electrical storage protectors installed in my house, and all of them are actually installed over the plastic electrical socket cover. That's how it's devised. You don't pull the socket, you pull the screw out of the socket and replace it with a screw that's pre-installed in the 360 adapter. So I misspoke there. Two, there's not necessarily going to be a gap between the adapter and the sheetrock unless the box inside your uh, wall is pushed pretty far forward. But I agree, Nathan, 
you are absolutely right. Don't let anything create a giant gap that you or a pitcher of a, a poorly thrown beer pong toss or your three-year-old with a power screwdriver or whatever. You don't want to. You don't want people to be able to get to the electrical lines. Only this behind one gives his three-year-old a power screwdriver. <laughs> he actually. You know what he really likes doing. I'm sure is, he's very, very able with it. One of the happiest moments I've ever seen him is helping me take the wheels off my truck with an impact hammer. Nothing says happy like a big giant <sighs> impact hammer bonding. in the hands of a three-year-old. <laughs> All right, well, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. With more than 20 million members, Netflix is the world's largest subscription service, instantly streaming TV episodes and movies over the internet and sending DVDs by mail. Members can instantly watch thousands of movies and TV titles on streaming devices like Microsoft's Xbox 360, Sony's PS3 game console, and the Nintendo Wii console. As a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want, for one low monthly price. There are no late fees or due dates. As a new member and a Techzilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to Netflix.com slash Techzilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so they know we sent you. Did somebody say mobile data? Yeah, Patrick stole the Novatel built uh, Verizon 4G LTE mobile hotspot MiFi off my desk this morning for a 4G fight. 4G mm -hmm. fight! Mm hmm. Fight! Fight! What are you doing? What are you looking at? No, now you've actually got me wondering about the uh, name there. So, okay, 4G, right? Obviously, I've, I've been a consumer of mobile data for a long time. Um, I, this is like the download speed versus the data cap fight. Mm hmm. And it's been kind of interesting taking a look at that because uh, um, I, really it's like no data cap on Sprint. Yeah. Stupid, ridiculous download speeds on Verizon's. Uh, my 5 4G, but I found some other things when I was comparing these. And look, by the way, before anybody emails either one of us, I know according to the ITU, nothing currently being sold and marketed as 4G qualifies as 4G according to the definition that the ITU finally put together like three years after people started pushing their 4G products. I know. Don't bother to email. I know. I got it. Anyhow, let's call us by Sprint Overdrive 4G versus Verizon My5 4G fight speed. 4G crosses 4G. Translation, Verizon kicks Sprint's ass. Although, when I first started testing this, it was really weird. I was in my cubicle in the office, the place where wireless goes to die. Sprint, who claims like three to six megabits per second, uh, 4G, I've never beaten two anywhere. I got five bars of coverage in my office, oddly enough. Apparently, it's only the office where AT&T goes to die. <laughs> well, is this because uh, there's just less people on Verizon's network? Hold Will on. you get to that? Okay. We'll get to that. Um, on the Sprint Overdrive, five bars coverage, 4G, 1.88 megabits per second down, 0.84 megabits per second up, 123 millisecond ping time. Completely typical performance for the Sprint network, no matter where I go. Verizon, my 5 4G LTE. Five bars coverage, 0.6 megabits per second down, 2.2 megabits per second up, 70 millisecond ping times. And then I tried it again, two megabits per second, and again, and it was weird. The speeds were really low. Hmm. Like much, like lower than the Sprint Overdrive. And I've got all these friends that have been testing this and talking about yeah, how- Yeah, I, I got pretty fast rates when I tested it out. Well, I went into setup, turned off 802.11 B and G, restarted it, hmm. and lo and behold, it went from a 70 millisecond ping to a nine millisecond ping, 39.46 megabits per second down, 33.7 megabits per second up in my office in San Francisco. Really? That's huge. I know, that seems, that's very different from the, the stuff that I got when I tested it. What were you it. getting performance I got wise? like, like 15, I got, I think I got like 12 or 14 up, mm -hmm. and then I got like, like something similar right. down. Well, here's a thought. But that could have been because of the I, I use speedtest.net, mm -hmm. and you know they they their flash testing doesn't work as well, I guess. With well, with I was using speedtest.net, but I th I think one of the one of the differences that may account for it is the location in the city, hmm. because I was testing over here in Dogpatch. That's there where were I like, tested it too. Really? Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, your results may vary. In any case. <laughs> Look, performance-wise, Sprint is getting crushed by Verizon. Doesn't matter if you're getting 15 megabits per second or 40 megabits per second, that's an ass kicking over less than two megabits per second. Coverage for either device is pretty much major markets. They, they make a big deal. Uh, Verizon's especially good at this because you, you look at the Verizon national map and it's a sea of red, which is their 3G coverage for almost pretty much Verizon 3G coverage is any, it, I've been in places where there are no asphalt roads, there are dirt roads, but there are Verizon coverage. However, if you look at the map, there are circles for active 
you know, markets. There are stars where they plan to have markets before the end of 2011, and there's a sea of red for 3G everywhere else in the country. Sprint's story is pretty similar. Most of the network for Sprint and Verizon is 3G. Sometime in the future, I would like to see both have 4G everywhere, but that is the distant future. Um, Verizon MiFi 4G, 50 bucks for five gigabytes a month, 80 bucks for 10 gigabytes a month. Sprint 4G, 50 bucks for unlimited 4G alone, 60 bucks for unlimited 4G, then also and, and five gigabytes of 3G because the 4G doesn't work in most of the country. Yeah. Um, you'll buy the hardware for both. Novatel makes the four uh, the V4G LTE mobile hotspot MiFi 4510L. Uh, they use an e-ink display for the batteries. It's I nice. think it's really clever. Yeah. You know, minimal information, also minimal battery drain. Um, PCMag.com says the Pantech uh, UML 290 cellular modem connects via USB instead of Wi-Fi. Should be a bit faster, but not much. But it's pretty crazy. You're looking at like three and a half to four hours of battery life off of this versus like two, maybe on a really good day if you mostly run 3G, two and a half hours battery life off the Sprint overdrive. It's interesting, there's no way to manually switch like, that I can find to 3G only on the MiFi, which should give you a little bit better battery life. But again, three hours and 48 minutes was like the result PC Mag got for the onboard 15 milli milliwatt, 1500 milliwatt, it's hard to say. That's really good. That's like twice the performance of getting out of the Sprint Overdrive. Um, I gotta be honest with you, I loved Sierra Wireless until I bought the Sprint Overdrive. Mm -hmm. I've owned a lot of Sierra, Sierra Wireless products over the years uh, for mobile data, and this one, the it, uh, I had to charge it for the first two months with the battery off uh, and the, the battery cover off and the battery facing up. What? Why? Because it kept, it would overheat. That's the, ridiculous. It would overheat and shut down and not charge. <laughs> Uh, if, especially if I put a, a battery down. That's a bad down. battery? Um, no, actually, one? when they did their first firmware update, that problem solved itself. Oh, right. So it's it's been a it's been a long trek. This is a much better product than it was when it launched. Um, but again, two hours of battery life. Sprint's network is considerably slower, like two megabits per second. Um, Sprint's selling the new Overdrive Pro 3G, 4G mobile hotspot now. It's the update to this one. Uh, similar battery life, I would expect. Uh, eight Wi-Fi users instead of five, a slightly bigger screen, $50 with a two-year contract. I would be tempted to dump my Sprint Overdrive uh, to get the Verizon MiFi, uh, which is 100 bucks with a two-year contract, um, but it's got the data caps, which kind of bums me out. Yeah, there's that. Like, if the five gigabyte data cap, I do four movies, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's I, really, I download four Yeah, it's really, for me, it would be just emergency kind of situations. I wouldn't use it as a day-to-day -day thing. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know it's how not many people do, but... It's not going to replace your cable modem. No. No. It, no. It, if it wasn't for the data cap, I could replace my cable modem with this. It's fast um, enough. Yes. Yeah. 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 Verizon, can you take away the data cap? And before anybody emails in about this, no, I'm not dumping my iPhone for a $249 HTC Thunderbolt, even though I can still buy the unlimited 4G data allowance for now. Hmm. But that is an interesting alternative. Although I don't think you're going to want to try to substitute for your home cable modem with your HTC Thunderbolt, which will only work when you're home, so hopefully your roommates don't need it. Or yeah. In any case, Ryzen 4G, ridiculously fast. Thumbs up. Thumbs up, big Both thumbs big up. Big thumbs up. Big thumbs up. I just don't want the data cap. I agree. I've been using it. No data cap. As well, and I data enjoy cap. It. I'll take that. That's a nice piece Thank of you. hardware. I like it very much. Yes. All right. Well, there's more Texella coming up, uh, but before we get to that, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoDaddy. During the month of May, our friends at GoDaddy have created a special offer for Texella fans. Between now and May 31st, you can get a deluxe hosting plan from GoDaddy for the same price you normally pay for the economy plan. Deluxe hosting offers more space, unlimited websites, more email accounts, more databases. You get the idea, you get more. Just use the code TECHMAY, that's T-E-K-M-A-Y, at checkout to get this fantastic offer. And don't forget to check out revision3.com slash GoDaddy for a list of all the amazing deals from GoDaddy that you can get through revision3.com. Jake wrote in, I just saved up enough for a MacBook Pro, but as Lion should be coming out in two or three months, should I wait? So, three questions. Would you wait for Lion? When will Lion be released? And how much will the upgrade be? Side question, how much were previous updates? Jake in the UK. Yeah, if you need a MacBook Pro, like, right now, then just 
buy one right now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait because of a software update. Um, MacBooks just got a refresh recently, so it's probably a pretty good time to buy. Right. Um, as to Lion, it offers a number of improvements, um, but we don't think you'll be missing out by picking up a laptop that uses Snow Leopard right now. Yeah. OS X Lion is expected to ship um, this summer. Prices haven't been finalized, and the rumors are that it will list from anywhere between $30 <laughs> or $130, basically. $129 bucks is usually the price point. Um, Snow Leopard was sold as a single license yeah. upgrade for $30, which was nice. The conventional wisdom being that the price reflected Snow Leopard as more of a like streamlined and a polished minor version. Evolution. Yeah, it was it was evolution. Snow Leopard as opposed to Leopard. Leopard. <laughs> it's a little change. Um, this though is uh, thereby leading to the suggestion that Lion will be higher in price because it's more different than Snow Leopard was from Leopard. You know what I mean? Like it's a, a new species rather than just an evolution yeah. in spots yeah. or the color between the spots. It, w look, we, we wouldn't wait to buy a Mac. If you need a MacBook, we wouldn't wait for Lion to buy one. The price difference isn't really going to make up that much for the time lost without the machine. Look, the choice is yours, but we say based on your hardware needs and not on a perceived benefit from you know minor price savings yeah. on the operating system. Totally agree. Um, you know, of course, if it'll turn out now that Lion will be released at Worldwide Developers Conference and people will benchmark it and it'll make every notebook run like 400% faster and you're going to be like, we hate you! Well, then you'll just upgrade and it'll be, you know, but the, the benefit you're getting now by having right. a computer that you can use that you need that works the way you need it to is probably, like you said, overweighed by the, the, the price difference when it actually comes out. Unless you're just looking for a shinier machine to watch YouTube videos from, you know, in the bedroom, in which case, you can wait. <laughs> we got this interesting little email from DM. He or she writes, Suppose I had to send something to WikiLeaks and or a close friend on a minute's notice. Should I have Tor on the ready in case of that? How secure is it? DM. Hmm. Paranoid, paranoid much? <laughs> oh, paranoid. Oh. So Tor, the onion router it's designed, it's, 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 more, it's an anonymizer, not an encryption tool. Um, it blocks governments and ISPs from tracking what you visit. It's basically an internet inside the internet that uses some nifty trickery to hide your original uh, IP address. If you have something super sensitive you want to transmit, your first action should be to encrypt that information before you put it anyway, anywhere near the internet. Uh, and we suggest you use the strongest encryption you can stand. Then agree on a mutually accessible method for sharing the file. This could be a, a webmail service, free file sharing service, secure FTP site access through Tor if you don't want your originating IP address. That's a really good idea for the whistleblowers in the audience. Plenty of different ways of doing this. Uh, if you have out, anybody out there has recommendations for DM, let us know by sending us an email at techzilla at revision3.com. I have a recommendation. You do? So, you know, take a floppy disk, put a piece of gum on it, stick it to the back of the uh, the bathroom wall behind the, the towel dispenser. Your field craft It's in the flawless. place where they put that thing that time. Um, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Gamefly. Gamefly is the largest online video game rental service and offers you a choice of over 7,000 new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds. With plans starting at just $15.95 a month, Gamefly members can rent one to four games at a time and keep them for as long as they'd like. Trust me, I've had Assassin's Creed Brotherhood for about six months now. There are no late fees, no due dates, and shipping is always free. Once you're done playing a game, send it back and Gamefly will send you the next available game on your list. If you really like that game you're playing, simply keep it on the Gamefly website and the game is yours at a discounted price. Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. I should probably do that. Tuxilla fans get a 15-day free trial when they go to www.gamefly.com. Skyler needs some help figuring out how to save valuable boot time on his Dell desktop. He says, hey Patrick and Veronica, first off, I'm a longtime listener, first time caller, and been a fan of Patrick since back in the screensaver days. Aww. Thank you so much. Anyhow, I'm currently dual booting Ubuntu 11.4.04 and Windows 7 on my Dell desktop, but I was wondering, is there a way to make my computer boot into Windows by default instead of Linux? It's not a big nuisance, but I would not, I would like to not have to just sit at the computer and just select Windows on the boot screen. I tend to multitask. Patrick and Veronica are amazing. Keep up the great work. I never miss an episode. Skyler in Lawton, Oklahoma. Ooh, uh, I'm not going to say it helps, but telling us we're amazing never hurts. Look amazing. at that smile. Look at how happy you made her. So we decided to post this one to our <laughs> Facebook page, and uh, many of the Linux users out there jumped in to help out Skylar. Mm -hmm. uh, Maruthi on the Facebook page uh, pointed us to a link on the Ubuntu documentation, which shows you exactly how to change the default OS. All right, so here are the steps. Uh, first, make a backup of menu.lst by punching the following into terminal. We'll write it up on the screen so you can freeze frame it and, and punch it in. Um, <laughs> then edit the menu.lst using a text editor by using the following command. 
Um, next, find this line in your open document. We'll just show it to you right here. Finally, replace the zero with the number on the startup list corresponding to the option you want counting from zero. So you would be looking for Windows 7. And as Alexandru, Ed, Andrew, and Alais mentioned, you can also use Startup Manager as a graphical alternative to editing the grub. Um, there are lots more suggestions and ideas. Check them out at facebook.com slash techzilla. We also have, uh, you'll just find that link there. We posted it recently. Um, up next, Mitch has a question about protecting his technology. OK, it's only tangentially related to technology. <laughs> But we couldn't pass up a kitten question. Kitties. I recently adopted a small kitten named Mia. Aww. Aww. And oddly enough, she cannot stay away from my electronics. Yep. She finds the endless shame pit of wires and cords behind my HDTV stand a nice warm place to mingle, which causes instant fear and paranoia for myself. Is there anything I can do or purchase to keep her out of my precious entertainment center? I'd welcome any suggestions. Thanks, Micah in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Isn't that cute? She's so cute. Oh my gosh, she's so cute. You know the one problem with kittens? Mm -hmm. They grow up to be cats. It's true. I'm a cat person, don't a get me wrong. A different set of issues. But the kitties, they are cute. So I come from a two-cat family home, uh, and, and this is one scenario where the spray bottle of water is probably not the best option. <laughs> Nothing more awkward than breaking the cat water. with the spray bottle and the HDTV and going poof and the yeah. magic smoke coming out. Um, the absolute best method that I personally have found from keeping cats away from anything they're not supposed to touch, be it electronics, furniture, what have you, is the stay away motion activated pet deterrent. Yes. What you, is that? Yes. Oh, it's the it's, kitty yes. behavior robot modifier. No, um, <laughs> you can find it on Amazon or online. It's like it's like forty bucks, right. but it works. It works perfectly. It's also kind of hilarious. So when your cat gets within three feet of the of the can, <gasps> it, it senses their. <laughs> Is that what it does? That, that's what it does. That's what it does. Um, it, it sprays a shot of compressed air at them. I'd do that again, but you'd kill me. No, I would literally kill you. I'd just, like, th there's like toddler germs all over my face right now. I know what I'm going to have. Like, right now. I'm going to have the flu in a day. Um, and so, like he said, like he demonstrated, it sprays a shot of compressed air at him, and, and it makes a really loud noise, like, like honk, honk. You can choose to just have it do the noise or the noise with the air. Though it's really the combo that teaches them to stay away fast. It's totally harmless. It scares the crap out of them the first couple of times, but they generally just don't like it. You know, it's not like hurting their ears. It's, no, it's I'm wondering harmless. if this will work with my son. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's completely trained our two very stubborn cats to get the heck away from our better furniture. Um, we actually use two. We put one on top of the furniture mm -hmm. and then one in the area surrounding the floor of the furniture. So if they come up to do the, Scratch the scratching, they, they don't get close enough. Wow. It has worked perfectly. And you um, don't have to be there, unlike the water spritzer, you don't have to right. be there watching all the time. And so it's it hilarious work. when you're downstairs and all of a sudden you hear, Wah! And then the skittering <laughs> cat noise. <laughs> and it's also really funny too when someone goes up to get a drink of water in the middle of the night and they get nailed with it, like a spouse or a family member or something. So Wah! it's not just feline behavior correction, but the opportunity for years of family amusement. Yeah, no, I highly, <laughs> highly recommend it. It's amazing. Excellent piece of technology. So you can put it in the freezer and scare And this is good away. too, because he can put it like way behind mm -hmm. his entertainment center. And so even if someone walks by the other side, the, it might be out of the range of the right. three feet to, to get a, a person to set it off. But mm -hmm. if the cat goes inside of it, then it's all bets are off. I was going to say like clean up your cables and you know put the machine in a box or something, but That's I think the kitty definitely not as torture fun. audio. It's device, not torture. The, the it's kitty just deterrent. Scary. The kitty deterrent. I swear to God, if Peter writes to me about these air cans, I'm going to be really <laughs> upset. It does not hurt them at all. I swear. They're very well adjusted. They just don't go anywhere near the chair. One final note from yes. Mike about home security cameras. If you have cameras on 100% of the time in your house, you are required by federal law to put stickers on the doors indicating that fact. Can I use the mattress thing to hang on the, no, those are chalk, but the, the thing is, is like, you cannot remove this tag from the mattress oh. under penalty of yeah, law. Sure. Sorry. Um, he goes on to say, um, even worse, if the camera does audio recording, you need to have stickers that reflect that fact or you run afoul of wiretapping laws, Ooh. Mike. So I actually tried looking this up and all I could find is that states are kind of split on the rules yeah. if the videotaping includes audio. And they say that that's usually in violation of uh, wiretapping and eavesdropping laws. Um, and if you, don't tell, you know, if you don't tell the person they're being recorded. If it's in your own home and you tell them, listen, you're being recorded, they, they have that information. They don't have to say the things they might otherwise say. 
but it's just with audio. I haven't been able to find anything about videotaping alone in your right. own personal home, um, and if you need to inform them with stickers. So I have this mental image that like you videotape the person stealing your television, and, yeah. and, and then you get sued well, because you videotape the person stealing the television out of your home. Well, there's all situation. sorts of precedents set by right. nanny cams. And nanny cams have been, like, cases with nanny mm -hmm. cams have been found to be okay in, like, the court of law. Should you not be familiar with the nanny cam concept, it's basically hiding video cameras and innocuous things that you might find in a children's room. A clock, right. a teddy bear, a toy, uh, whatever. So, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I found cases where that, had, that footage had been admissible, even mm -hmm. with sound, in court. Mm -hmm. um, but, so Mike, if you have some kind of documentation about this supporting your claims, please send it our way. Yeah. Um, if, if there's any lawyers out there that can tell us, <laughs> we probably can't afford your rate, but if you want to tell us if you know, the law is pro bono, that would be super. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if... If you know, there are there's, any there's federal a, lawyers out there yeah. familiar with wiretapping... Well, with, there's a reasonable expectation of privacy in your own home, mm -hmm. like if, if you have guests over, that they're not going to be videotaped in the bathroom, for example. This is there's the age child of the pornography internet laws. and YouTube. There's all sorts of laws right. that can you know, go against what, you know, or agree with what he's saying, but I don't think just coming into your own home and being recorded, right. without audio at least, is against federal law. This sounds like a wonderful opportunity, seriously, if, if, if there's someone in the legal profession out there that would like to illuminate this issue for us, please, please do, because now I'm, I'm afraid to, you know, leave the security camera on up in my house. Well, I, like I said, the nanny cam thing is okay, right. and people have security cameras. I don't know if those stickers that, like, ADT gives this you count like as the, notification. The don't be a jerk syndrome, where mm -hmm. it's like, don't put in, like, nanny cam security monitors, and then when your uncle and Aunt Louise are doing Stay something with you. naughty in the right. bedroom, post it That's on YouTube. That's that reasonable expectation yeah. of privacy situation. But don't yeah. be a jerk kind of thing. Don't be a D-bag. Don't, yeah. <laughs> if you have a burning tech question for us, whether it's actually about flaming technology or just a very urgent question, send it in. TechZilla.com is the email address, or you can post it on our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash TechZilla. And of course, we're also on YouTube at YouTube.com slash TechHD and the Twitter nets at, at TechZilla, Robert Heron, Patrick Norton, and Veronica. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching TechZilla. Kitties. So it is. It is. It is. It is.